Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Production funding for Common Ground is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Hi, and welcome to this week's edition of Common Ground. I'm your host, Ashley Hall. Common Ground is a new weekly series that highlights northern and central Minnesota culture. We'll explore the unique people, places, and events that are an important part of our region. Each week, Common Ground videographers, editors, and myself will take viewers on a journey of exploration into the worlds of art, history, and culture. This week, we'll introduce you to a local Bemidji artist who uses the contrasts of lights and darks to make remarkable watercolor paintings. A glassmaker who's also from Bemidji will take us through step-by-step -step on a stained glass project. And you'll get a taste of Norwegian culture as we join the Sons of Norway in an annual tradition. I began as a abstract painter years ago, and I was very good at it. But what I discovered was they didn't make me happy. What made me happy was realism. Someone says, oh, she really knows what she's doing. I don't necessarily know what I'm doing, but I'm creating something, and um, I'm making it mine. I have been teaching national workshops now for the last few years, and what I've discovered is people are scared to go really dark in a painting, and that's what gives it um, the volume, the depth, and the drama. And in this painting, um, what I'm going to show you is how when you put a light against a dark and a dark against a light, it creates this nice nuance of um, back and forth. It creates depth. When I paint, um, I, I set up my still lifes and I usually take many, many, many pictures. Um, I like to zoom in and get close-ups. I, I move things. They're not always the same arrangement. As you can see here, it's the same arrangement from a different angle. Um, but what I'm looking for is what is going to make an interesting painting. And I don't always see that. So I take, like I say, many, many, many photographs. Um, and then what it gives me also is the resource for when I'm painting. Now I have close-ups to understand the information that I'm seeing. Um, this was the picture that I had selected to paint. I have been painting on it now for um, a couple of weeks. Um, what I did was I blew it up so that I could look at it. When I do that sometimes, I also think, what is my background going to be? And in this case, I even tried to draw in some fake blinds and a landscape to see what am I going to do in the background. But this was such a busy painting, I decided what I needed was simplicity. And I love darks and lights. And so this is where I'm at right now with the um, background. And I think this is going to work much better. It's important to have darks against light so things come forward. Um, I'm saving whites here. These are not completed yet, but it's going to set this forward. Um, the more darks I get here, the more grounded this will be. Um, at this stage, I'm also taking some freedoms and putting in more reflections adding color. Um, I'm putting in a lot of rosy colors over here because I, I really like warm light um, for me personally rather than cool light. Because I work in transparent colors, they tend to wash out as they dry. They get lighter. And I go back in time and time again and try to layer it up to depth. And that is why some people really are confused as to um, is that watercolor? But that's because I paint with many, many layers, um, sometimes up to 50 layers. I'm going to just pull that dark line down. And I'm doing this because also in this area, this spoon rest is casting a greater shadow. 
so we know in this area it's got to be darker. And I can see by doing that um, how much nicer all of these would be if they were a little darker. Do you see that? Going dark can make such a difference. Um, it starts to make the bamboo pieces pop forward. I will need to, if you will look at the photo, the nice darks here. This rounded shape that's being created is the lip of this spoon, spoon rest. And so eventually I'm going to have to bring those darks way down into here. And so very gradually I will keep doing this until I feel I have kind of captured that, the depth that I would like to see. I have to be careful that I don't have um, hard edges on some of this because um, light like that is kind of diffused. So I can just soften that edge a little bit so it doesn't feel quite so tough. I just keep my finger on my painting. I'm working all over the painting, um, not just um, in one area because I want to carry that thought. Um, that glow is so pretty. I think I want it to happen in this area as well. So now I am interpreting my, my photograph. I'm not painting just what I see here, but what I would like to see. When I put on jeweler's glasses, um, I can really see the fine edges to make sure that they're crisp and, and um, they make sense. So I use jeweler's glasses a lot for my final detail. I need to be getting as many different values or shades of brown as I can. And I'm just going to try to soften that edge so it looks like diffused light. I don't want it to be hard here. But already that section you can see is popping a little more. Um, it's because I'm running a dark up to a light. If I don't, um, it would be very, very flat. On this painting, I bet I will do this for another week. Um, I will be making value adjustments as long as it takes to make this a painting that I feel is worth um, competing with on a national level. I am going to definitely have to darken this and this in order to make this one really shine. Um, this will get quite a bit darker. Um, I could lay one wash on that now for you to see just what a difference going dark again will do. And it's so beautiful the way it is right now. You, th you think to yourself, oh, why don't I just let it be because I really like it. But what I've learned is I'm going to like it more if I do this. Um, the photograph is mine. The still life setting is mine. Um, everything is mine. But I still like to make it even more mine by adding my, you know, my little quirkiness to it. But I love detail. I got involved through working here when Pat and Dean hired me to work here. Of course, I had to learn. I knew about the beading end of it, but I had no clue whatsoever on glass. And we are going to mount the pattern onto our board and get started on the process. This is our gorgeous glass we're going to be working with. And we just want to secure the pattern down so it's not going to move. And then we'll put a protective shield over it so that when we get into the soldering, we aren't going to burn the paper up. And the shield that goes on it is just a plain plastic. So we can still see through it and see what our design looks like. And here's all our pieces. Now I'm going to move the board over to the side because we're going to now concentrate on this board which is a special board used for cutting our glass. It's 
got little holes in it, so if we have little chips of things coming off, it will go right down into the cracks. We try to keep as close to the inside of the line as we can, instead of the outside. And we have less to grind, which will be what we're going to do next. Okay, now with this, I want to cut my glass in half so I have the two different pieces. So I'm going to start with this one. And I won't have any problems with breaking on one of the other side. I like to use my fingers sometimes as a guide. Okay. And I can see that piece will go in here this way. Now we have to just get them all to fit nice. So now it's time to go to a grinder. This has a diamond stone on the top grinding part and this runs with water so we have to get the water going we're going to get the wheel going picking out the glass and then creating something that I guess you can visualize it sort of but it really doesn't come together till you're done with it I guess just the finished product, I like doing this kind of stuff and I always have been a person that does a lot of handcrafts. This dark turquoise will match up with the rest of it. And, all right, looks like we're doing good on our pieces. Then the next step is cleaning them and we'll foil. The foil is important to have on there so when you put the solder on, it has something to stick to when we line the glass up so it's kind of in the middle of your foil so you have a little bit on both sides so you can pinch it around sometimes that's difficult if you get a little off kilter you can just take a razor blade and trim it up and you just stick it on there and I like to crease it with my fingers so we'll use the pins to pin it together and that'll hold it pretty much in place and then I'll get my other stuff set up This is used to put on our seams so that when we put the solder down, it'll stick. And you'll hear a little sizzle kind of noise, almost like meat hitting a fry pan. It gives just a slight sizzle. And what this does is help bind the solder to the copper. And we're going to tack the corners first. I have a little gap that I've got to fill up. But I'm just going to start to tack, and what I'm doing is I'm just going to do the edges, and you can hear that sound. So we can take these all out. Kind of like that, and then we can smooth it over and make a real nice bead. And then we can do a little touch-up after we get down. Sometimes you can get an excess and you can just kind of pull it along and it'll straighten that all out nice. You can do it the way I just did it or you can do it this way, which is just a little bit here and a little bit there and then you can run it all together too. Now I'm going to kind of wipe the little bumps of solder off my glass. When I look at this one, or my new ones that I've been doing, and it's just unbelievable. But that's where practice makes perfect. You know, coming up with your idea, coming up with your colors and putting it all together. I guess I also think about it as a very ancient art. You know, a craft, actually. Well, our beginners have done stuff similar to this. Um, they've done the fleur-de-lis type of design, which has become a very popular design. Um, most of the pieces that they do are about 15 to maybe 20 pieces, starting out with. Um, similar to this in size, maybe a little smaller in some things. All we're doing here is just widening the channel a little bit by
pushing it through on an angle or kind of wiggling it so it widens it just a titch, which will help fit it better. It just basically snaps down over the top of it all. I have to use two kinds of patina in this one. One for the solder and one for the zinc. First, so you'll see it's going to start turn color right away. And the more you put on it, the darker it's going to be. Well, this is where you really get to see your project coming out when you have it when you start changing the colors on the solder to patina. This is what we call, it's a finishing compound. And we just squirt a little of that on there. And we're gonna kind of blot this in. You don't really wanna rub it. I guess in a way it's you could almost describe it as a you know a glass picture it'd be almost like doing a drawing or a painting you know coming up with your idea or coming up with your colors and putting it all together I guess I also think about it as a very ancient art you know a craft actually very ancient and I guess sometimes I even think about you know what what it would have been like to do something like this back then Sons of Norway is an international organization. Its main purpose is actually started as an insurance uh, company for immigrant Norwegians. It was founded in uh, January of 1895 in Minneapolis. It's an international organization. We have members even in Norway itself. We have a few lodges there. Members have benefits like life insurance. Uh, they can have set up annuities, uh, car insurance. Like I said, its main purpose originally was as an insurance company. And now we try to, we have cultural programs where members can take these programs and earn different badges for different levels of things like wood carving, genealogy, uh, rose mauling language, of course, Norwegian language, reading and music. Uh, there's probably 13 or 14 different cultural programs. We have programs at all of our meetings that primarily deal with something Norwegian as far as a tradition or immigrant stories or dealing with history of different areas of history like World War II. Originally it was only open to Norwegians or of Norwegian descent. But now you, can, you don't have to be Norwegian to belong. It used to be you could only be a male to belong. And of course that changed many, many years ago. And we usually average 40 to 50 members every meeting, which I think is a good average for an organization to have for attendance. At this point, I believe we have around 100 and, right around 140. What Norwegian I speak has pretty much been self-taught. Um, my great-grandfather didn't want anybody to learn Norwegian, I guess, because, and that happened a lot. They were here in America, they wanted, you to, they wanted you to be American, so a lot of people, second and third generation like me, didn't get a chance to learn Norwegian unless we did it on our own. We have quite a few in our organization here in Bemidji that still speak fluent Norwegian. 
So it's fun to listen to them talk. And the Sons of Norway website has a language course online that you can work with. We worked with that. And then we've gotten to the point where most of us try to have conversations. They're not real in-depth conversations yet, but and at the beginning we had a couple fluent speakers that kind of tailed off and coming after they figured might have figured we were along far enough to to take it on our own and just in very informal. Very and it doesn't matter whether you speak one word or many words that you know we welcome anybody there. It's always every Saturday at 11 o'clock at the Wild Hair in Bemidji. So. Um, and that's basically how a lot of our people have advanced in learning the languages, meeting on each Saturday. <laughs> That was good. We enjoy a lot of good fellowship. Uh, it's basically not a business meeting. Tonight we're here just to have a good time. Uh, we always sing Christmas carols, um, some in Norwegian and some in English. And uh, we have the audience participate a lot in the sing-alongs. Tonight we'll have a, oh, a couple readings, one a humorous one and, and uh, a poem and then we're gonna be the Norse Tones, our group, the Norse Tones will be singing three songs and we'll also be reading the Christmas story in English and in Norwegian uh, from the Bible. So uh, tonight is just a night to enjoy each other, ourselves and, and uh, part of our culture. In Norway they have, this time of year they have called the Julenissen, which is a Christmas like our Santa Claus. It's a Christmas elf or Nissa. And uh, there's also the song that we're going to sing is about a barn Nissa or Fios Nissa. And they are out in the barn. Each farm was believed to have a Nissa that lived on their farm. And if on Christmas Eve, if he got a big bowl of Christmas porridge to eat in the barn, you'd take it out and leave it in the barn for him to eat. He would protect your farm, bring you good crops. Or, if you didn't serve him the porridge, you were in trouble for pretty much the whole year. Uh, cows could be moved somewhere, whatever. Dirty little tricks that he'd play throughout the year. Your crops would be bad. But if you kept him with that porridge on Christmas Eve, and that's what that song is about. Everybody seems to like that. And we always end with Silent Night. Uh, we sing three verses in Norwegian, and then we have everybody join in on the English first two verses. It, you keep that tradition and you don't lose it. You know, you don't lose the culture completely. Jesu naven går vi til bords at spise og drikke på den år. Dig gud til ære oss til gaven, så far vi mat i Jesus naven. Amen. We hope that you enjoyed this week's look at artists and culture. Thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you next week right here on Common Ground. If you have a segment idea for Common Ground, please contact us at legacy at lptv.org or call us at 218-333-3022. or copies of Common Ground, please call 218-333-3020. Production funding for Common Ground is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. If you enjoyed this segment of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org.